Hello, everyone. My name is Ian Rowe. And I'm Nike Fajors. And welcome to The Invisible Men, where we make the achievements of incredible men invisible no more. Hello, and welcome to another episode of The Invisible Men. My name is Ian Rowe, resident fellow at the American Enterprise Institute. I'm Nike Fajors, a member of the Leadership Network at AEI. All right, Nike, good to see you. And uh, as our viewers know, we are all about highlighting and showcasing black excellence, just amazing individuals who are doing incredible work that you may not be aware of, and uh, we need to shine a light. And today, we have the great Dr. Anthony Bradley. Hello, Dr. Bradley, how are you? I'm doing well, thanks for having me on. Yeah, I, we can't wait, we were looking forward to this conversation. You are the Professor of Religious Studies at the King's College, uh, which also where you are the Director of the Center for the Study of Human Flourishing. I can't wait to hear more about that. And you're also a Research Fellow at the Acton Institute. Um, I mean, uh, your, your, your accomplishments already uh, uh, speak volumes. Um, and, and, and who is buried near you? S several people. The, the King's College <laughs> The King's College is, is located in the financial district. We are about four or five blocks away from Ground Zero, right around the corner from the New York Stock Exchange. Behind that, of course, as people may know, is the Trinity Episcopal Church, uh, where Alexander Hamilton is buried. So if you come out of our building, you make a right, you literally go about a block, make a left, and and he's buried right there. Right. Well, you know, it's it's famous from uh, from um, the the show Hamilton, right? He's, he's gets a scholarship to King's College. Absolutely. Uh, so uh, so before we get into your incredible uh, work that you do today, tell us a little bit about Dr. Anthony Bradley when he was just Anthony. Um, as you were rising, and if there were any moments, uh, experiences that you had that that helped helped you create your own worldview and your pathway, that's a, that's a great question. You know, I, I often divide this in, in in two parts. There's sort of the the the, the preschool loan debt Anthony and the post school loan debt Anthony. So that's how my, that's how my life is divided. That preschool loan debt, uh, school loan debt, Anthony. I was I was raised in Atlanta, and I am from the uh, sort of bougie, blue blood Atlanta black folk, Spellman, uh, Morehouse, AKAs, Deltas, Qs, Kappas, uh, friends of MLK, a black community in Southwest Atlanta, also known as SWATs. So I was I was born and raised in a community of people who were, you know, coming out of the civil rights movement, right? They sort of, my parents are now uh, around, around 80 years old. And I was really formed and shaped by, by what W.B. E.B. Du Bois called the, the Atlanta Negro. Uh, extremely driven, uh, professional, a uh, folk who wanted to merge, I think, both morality, but also a sense of, of progress beyond, beyond what they were coming out of. Uh, in, in Jim Crow. And so I was raised in a community where it was nothing but possibility, right? It was, it was nothing, there was nothing uh, to imagine but hope. And we were, we were raised to think like that, right? In Atlanta, uh, you're just around black success all the time. And, and so in my estimation, that's all I knew black people to be were successful because I grew up around black doctors and lawyers and dentists and business people. And so for me, that was that was the norm. And so when I went to university uh, to study uh, biology, you know, coming out of Atlanta at, at, at that time, if you were black in Atlanta in the in the 70s and 80s, you basically had three options for a career. You could be a doctor or a lawyer or a business person. Uh, that's how the imagination was. My niece, who was raised in the same church, in their five in their in their kindergarten class, they have a song where they sing. You know, you start k kindergarten and then elementary school, and then at the end of the song, right, that they teach five year olds, and then there's grad school. <laughs> okay, wow. so you have a you have five year olds thinking about not college, not high school as the norm, not college as the norm. College is breathing, 
right? School um, starts. School okay. starts at grad school. That's when your education starts because college is just it's just normal. So I was I was sort of raised in that in that in that community in in, in Atlanta, and I've always been really curious. Uh, and I've also been a fan of, of public television. Now, here's why this is important. Uh, there was a show on NBC called Family Ties. Oh, yeah. Sure. You remember that show? Yeah. yeah. Yep. And Michael J. Fox played the character of, of Alex P. Keaton. Yep. And Alex P. Keaton, as some may remember, was a huge fan of Ronald Reagan and, and Richard Nixon. Uh, and I remember on one episode, I think he mentioned this show called The Firing Line. Uh, oh, yeah. which is yeah. the Wilma yeah. Buckley yeah. show. Yeah. And so I started watching in in middle school and high school, I started watching uh, uh, Bill Buckley on the firing line. Wow. And that's really opened up my, my mind to alternative views because on the one hand, because he was always fair with people with whom he disagreed. So I sort of got the sort of black community narrative, the sort of standard, uh, uh, black progress narrative from these legends, the children of the civil rights movement. But then I also got this this view from the right that, that William F. Buckley brought as he interrogated some of these uh, perspectives. And it just I just started asking tons and tons of questions. And it just exposed me to, to the reality that there are views that are different than, than that, those which I were raised with. And some of these ideas aren't bad ideas. And, and that, that was my introduction in, in high school to running across the writing of Thomas Sowell. Oh. And as soon as I started reading Sowell, uh, that's when things changed because one, one of the great contributions of Thomas Sowell, and I've actually adopted this in my, it's in my own writing, is to let the data lead the conversation not ideology not what your grandmama said not not what you're supposed to say at thanksgiving like let the data lead right the discourse and as soon as the data started to lead the discourse that's when i began to make some departures uh, from that sort of standard uh, southwest atlanta primarily democratic uh, uh, a narrative about about the way the world is because the data didn't always fit those those realities uh, last point and it really dovetailed nicely into the center for human flourishing that i run at the king's college that 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 program that program started out as a as a way for me to to launch uh, uh, several different programs that might challenge some prevailing theories and our our first program was 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 criminal justice reform that was our our first major program and and we were studying human flourishing because i believe it's better to be for something right than to just be against something else yep Right. So yep. being anti something isn't good enough. Being anti police, being anti uh, prisons, that's not good enough. You have to be for something. Yep. And so in the spirit of being for something, mainly I'm for people never, ever going to jail or having contact with police. This this center is was designed for the purpose of of, of proposing things that we could be for. And I am for criminal justice reform, but I read Michelle Alexander's book, and it didn't fit the data. Who's wait, which her book didn't fit the data? The the New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, oh, I'm familiar which with is that. a which is a, a great introduction into the conversation. Yeah. But the New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander did not fit the data, and for me. I'm, I, I don't, you know, I'm, I'm non-tribal in terms of, in terms of, of left, right. I, I, I you know, th those, those things to me don't, don't drive me. What drives me is the data, yep. right? And if your data's wrong, I'm coming after you. I don't care what side you're on. And if you're letting data, sorry, if, if you're letting ideology obscure what the data says, I'm I'm coming. I'm coming. I'm coming after you, right? And so and so as soon as as soon as I realized that the data didn't fit that prevailing narrative, we can come back to that in just a moment if you'd like. 
that that really inspires uh, so so much of so much of my work. But it really started with watching Family Ties. Uh, Michael J. Fox leading me to William F. Buckley. Buckley leading me to Thomas Sowell. Thomas Sowell making me care about data. Wow, that that's amazing. Why do you think Thomas Sowell, who is incredible, and there's a new book coming out about him called Maverick, but what is it about Thomas Sowell and the challenge that many, particularly black leaders, have in not uh, citing his work or not elevating his beliefs when it comes to how we think about progress in the black community? It, it may it may in part be because a Thomas Sowell doesn't really play rhetorical games and he just he just doesn't mince words he, he and he lets the data do his talking for him and that doesn't sell well right and he, he says really hard things that people don't want to hear and and he he makes a sort of contrast in terms of the data that makes you ask different sorts of questions and what the prevailing narrative tells you the problems are uh, actually are he he what he does is he raises the sort of causal disruptions that make you question well is it really racism is it really systemic racism is it really the man is it really these external uh, uh, issues driving some of these pathologies that we see, and I'm using the word pathologies on purpose. You're not supposed to say it anymore uh, because it's it's taboo, right? Although uh, William Julius Wilson, you, you could say it in the 90s, right? When William Julius Wilson and the crew at Harvard and Chicago were talking about black pathology, you could say it back then, but you can't say it now. I'll just say challenges how about that right so when you're when you're talking about some of the some of the challenges in the, in the black community what thomas soul does that people don't like is he he complicates the race narrative as the causal variable that that produces the disparities that we see between you know those who are making pros progress and those that aren't between social and economic mobility and people and those who are stagnant he's going to complicate that that narrative and if you are sold if you sort of bought the the idea that racism uh, 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 racial discrimination systemic racism is the primary causal narrative for all of the challenges all of the disparities that we see in the black community today or i shall say in the in black communities to, uh, today uh, thomas soul is not your friend because he and Shelby Steele and Jason Riley, right, and others are going to are, are, are going to include that it's it's not it's not that race has never been a problem, right? But there are other variables that matter. Marriage matters, education matters, fatherhood matters, right? Uh, um, the 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 ability for one to delay gratification matters trauma matters the culture of your community matters all those other thing all those other things matter and it complicates that 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 race driven a sort of racial reasoning narrative and people just do not like that and, and the other thing lastly which i think is unfair to thomas soul is they, they they just don't think he's nice <laughs> <laughs> they think they think their brother has no empathy. Um, you know, he doesn't care about us. He only says, you know, he only says things. He never said anything positive about the black community. So he just doesn't like us. He's 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 much more of a sellout and and, and Uncle Tom. But if you understand Thomas Sowell's story of growing up, right, single mom in the hood. Going, he was he was a scrapper. He's a fighter. Uh, almost got sucked into gangs. If he hadn't gone in the military, he probably would have been in prison. Right. So he knows what it's like to be in the communities that he writes about. And so he and Walter Williams and others who also grew up with challenges, they're saying, "Hey, wait a minute, right." We've got to talk about some other things, and, and a lot of people, I think, just aren't willing to to sort of unravel, or maybe, or maybe, aren't aren't willing to uh, 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 assent to the fact that, that 
th- things are more complicated than than sort of race being that primary or maybe just that exclusive causal variable. You know, Anthony, I want to I want to keep this theme of, of data first and, and, and ask for your opinion about some commentary that uh, the first lady, Michelle Obama, recently had. I don't know if you saw it, but in brief, if you hadn't seen it and for our viewers, she was talking about the, you know, the George Floyd case and she pivoted to her daughters who are now driving. And she stressed an incredible amount of concern for their safety and the potential for Malia and Sasha to be confronted by a rogue police officer. You should use the phrasing, they might play their music too loud and the officer may only see the back of their heads and I'm very concerned about that. That struck me as peculiar, both in terms of thinking about the data of you know African-American girls and women being confronted by police, but then also the context of not even the talented 10th, the talented uh, 1,000th of a 10th uh, dealing with these matters. But my opinion is not relevant. I'd like to just hear your perspective on that. Well, I, you know, I, I know some police officers, oh. right? Uh, I mean, you know, there are many of us that have police officers in our families, even right. Some cousins to a police officers and things like that. And 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 Duke Duke officers make mistakes. Yes, they're human. Um, are, are there opportunities where officers may take advantage of the power? Absolutely. Uh, do they look for reasons to pull people over? Absolutely. If you're a black person, it, it will be difficult to make it through life without being pulled over. By, by law enforcement, that stuff happens. It happened to me when I was living in St. Louis, when an, 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 a, a, I was coming out of a, a Jeep dealership and an officer pulled me over in a very wealthy Jewish neighborhood. And he said, I made a rolling stop, which I did, right? I'll confess that I did not come to a complete stop, okay? And though he, he walked over and he looked in my car and he said, how, could, how can someone like you afford a car like this? Right. Right? And I was like, well, actually, I can't afford it. My parents did. They bought it for me as a graduation present from college. <laughs> Sir, right? <laughs> right, right, right. Right. And so, and so I, was, I, I remember being, being really, really uh, uh, upset about those things. That 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 uh, 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 episode, and so those 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 things happen. But I would say that it's it's an exaggeration to tell someone to tell a person of color that that should be the expectation. Yeah. That is, instead of seeing it as as the outlier in your life, to sort of see that to sort of craft this narrative that the police. Are are sort of like lions in waiting uh, on, on on black Americans as they drive their motor vehicles uh, to and fro. I think that's 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 exaggerated, right? It's, it, it sort of builds this hysteria that the police are are against against us, and again, the data just doesn't doesn't really prove that. When you see, for example, that. Regardless of your race, people have experiences with with policing. Uh, uh, if you look at the data, uh, you know, being white doesn't mean you're never going to get pulled over. Uh, and so, I, I think I think it's 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 a bit extraordinary uh, to to so, to sort of assume that that it's us against the police. By the way, many of the police are black, and so um, you know, they sort of use that. that. Yeah, are, in in fact, in in fact, in most major cities, right, you have a a, a massive a population of, of black officers, and so I would I would say you know to Michelle, I, I understand your concern. You should be concerned about about your uh, 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 daughters. I would I would be more concerned about them being hit by a drunk driver uh, than 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 them being taken over by police. I would actually be in some neighborhoods be more concerned about them being carjacked. Uh, than than being pulled over by the police and harmed that way. There there are lots of other reasons. The data says that you should be more concerned uh, than your daughter's being pulled over by by the police. And and what what I find is that that we have really we really have to stop telling 
uh, black people who were y- young that this country is against them uh, and that the, the institutions and structures and, and so much of the things they have access to are actually are actually positioned against their flourishing is is a is a narrative that sets people up i think for the type of situations that, that make the news uh, uh later on yeah well i i i want to ask one more question again on this theme of data um i just i just gave testimony uh in congress related to the racial wealth gap and one of the one of the the pieces of data that's constantly reiterated is this idea that the average uh wealth you know a median wealth of the average white family based on 2019 data is about eight times that of the average black family and the, and the, if you look at the data solely looking at race that actually is true the the it's only eight times the actual raw amount is about hundred sixty thousand dollars right so that's data and there are people that use that data to make the case that that gap is so huge that there is literally nothing. I mean, Nicole Hannah-Jones actually literally writes this. There is nothing you can do, not get married, not get a home, not buy a home, not get educated. Nothing can make up for, quote, 400 years of racialized plundering, end quote. And so, and then if you believe that, then you bring in a lot of other interventions, right? Like reparations, other major government transfers. But one of the things, so I testified that, well, that is true. But if you look at just a couple of other factors, such as uh, family structure and education, the average married black two-parent college-educated household on an absolute basis has wealth of nearly $220,000 and three times that of the average white single-parent household. And the, and the gap, the racial wealth gap, is about $160,000. So it's, it's literally almost equal to the gap if you're only looking at race. And so when you talk about data, I think it has to go even deeper because people can manipulate anything, any data to their purposes, right? So I'm just curious, how, how yeah. do you have a data-driven conversation when some people are selecting yes. choosing which data matters? Absolutely. I, I think one, one, one of the things that I, I learned in, in grad school was the, the, the difference between a multivariate analysis and a univariate analysis, right? A univariate analysis looks at one variable and seeks to reduce that one variable as the explanatory variable for, for phenomena. Yep. Uh, ra- whereas a multivariate narrative, right, looks at multiple variables, multiple issues that might offer some explanation for for phenomena as they appear in reality. And when you talk about these sorts of disparities, I don't care what it is. Uh, it could be uh, wealth. It could be health uh, uh, between blacks and whites. We are uh, we are only helped if we use a multivariate platform for analysis. So you have to control for lots of things in order to see the root cause of what those disparities are. And here's why. If you don't get the analysis right, you'll get the solutions wrong. Correct. Right? So if 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 we if we if we believe that the problem is race, then we wrongly will think that, well, if we solve the waste problem, that'll close the, the, the wealth gap. Now, the challenge, of course, is when you, and maybe this is why people don't like it, right? If you introduce the multivariate analysis and you see that actually when you control for marriage, uh, when you control for education. education levels, when you control, when you control for geography, and age, age, right? When you control for all those other things, those disparities actually begin to to reduce, almost, almost it's eliminate it. And, and in fact, reverse. Right? And in absolutely. Fact- Abs- absolutely, right? And we're, we're doing better uh, than, than whites. But when you include other groups, like Asian Americans, more disruption, 
because the gap between right between black and white, the gap between Asian and white is is even is even greater in 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 in, in many cases, right? Yep. And so and, this and, is the and, and communities within the black community, right? You might have Nigerian Americans. That's where I was going to go next. Right. Absolutely. Right. And so when you start controlling for other variables uh, like immigration, when you look at, for example, black African immigrants, Jamaican immigrants, right? When you look at those populations, you begin to see that the the sort of racial reasoning narrative won't hold. It just won't hold water. When, when, for example, I think it was by 2005, about half of all of the, the black undergraduates at Harvard were, were black immigrants, right? They were from Kenya, Nigeria, West Africa, you know, the, the Caribbean. They, they weren't these descendants of, of American slavery. That's, and, that, that's, and Harvard is doing this right now, right? And so I think I think if I could encourage people, you know, to really to really um, do the homework to sort of interrogate the 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 multiplicity of variables that tend to impact reality, because because this is what we know when we think about the way that way, the way in which we live, we don't come to our our income levels by our jobs alone. Right, we we come to those things because of our families. We come to those things because of our networks, because of our education, because we were born in a certain place. Because I mean, all of those things that contribute to our own success. Those are the sorts of things that we need to unpack. We want to understand some of these disparities because those, when we understand what variables after we control for those things contribute to the disparity then we can actually address those things right and i've I've been saying for years and this is not popular but i'm about to say is that we we are we are not going to have massive amounts of, of progress in terms of black social and economic mobility until we deal with a marriage problem until we deal with with black fatherhood, until we do, until we improve education outcomes and get kids out of bad schools, right? I don't care. I don't care how big that that reparations check is, right? It won't be sustained without without us dealing with these other variables because those other variables are actually going to undermine and sabotage long-term sustainable social and economic mobility you know it's 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 a great point i often think about you know the list the, the dozens upon dozens of professional athletes who earn millions of dollars and within you know six seven eight ten years they're bankrupt they're they're arguably worth less than when they started. And so, you know, in terms of the big check solving all these problems, it's, it's, uh, it's silly, actually. Yeah, I, th- I think I think the average, I think the average, uh, actually, I'll go back, I think it's something like 80% of NBA players are broke three to four years yes. uh, once they re- once they leave the league. Yes, it's unbelievable. Right? And 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 those are you know th- those skills of, of money management. I mean those those skills of, of delayed gratification. Those government can't solve those, right? And I, I think I think one of the problems is that people and, and maybe maybe this is why we don't want to do the multivariate analysis is that there are just some things in terms of solutions to problems that plague black communities that government cannot solve and and if you are willing to consent that right if if you're and maybe this is why people aren't open to it if government can't solve those things we actually don't want to use the imaginations necessary to bring the appropriate stakeholders around the table and say we all have a role to play in this right and so we need to be strengthening as we do address race issues we need to be strengthening job creation right we got to have open and free markets we need to be strengthening the rule of law everybody's got to be treated the same we need to be strengthening as i said earlier right marriage and family and listen 
This is unpopular. People need some moral formation, right? Uh, this is something that I heard uh, Kate Cole James said. You know, she said, "What's the definition of a of a black conservative?" She, she I think she, I think she said something like, um, "Daring to believe what your grandmother told you," <laughs> right? Right. That's what it means. Right. And and I, I think I think there are just some 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 basic uh, fundamental virtues that black communities have always valued regardless of, of, of income level that always lead to thriving that always lead to flourishing but the government institutions are not the place to teach those moral values right the, and and and, the, and 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 they can't do it because they don't even practice them mm. <laughs> right mm. you can't you can't expect the virtue of delay gratification which by the way if you want to do studies on on wealth building right that's the difference people that can delay gratification and those who can't and i can tell you right now there's not a politician in washington dc on either side of the aisle who can show me how congress practices delay gratification seriously especially in the contemporary moment trillion here yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You're talking yes. about real money. Yeah. Listen, we're we're only at May and I think I think President Biden is up to almost six trillion dollars in, in in proposals. And so and so uh you know we, we have to we have to be willing to uh, disrupt some of these narratives so we can get the solutions that actually work. Uh, so that people can can live the lives that they're intended to live. And and, and and last point, I think I think income is a terrible uh, uh, way to assess m- mobility and progress. Mm-hmm. And this is something I've I've learned from economists. Like standard of living is 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 uh, is a uh, much better and and maybe even even a more accurate way of looking at, w- at how people are, are living, how they're doing. They may not. They may not have a high income, but they still might have three televisions, um, right? Three microwave ovens, two cars, uh, eighteen pairs of shoes, kitchens full of food. But their income might not be might not be that great. Right. Right. So I, I and, and 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 lastly here, I think I think black folk are doing way better than than we're told. Uh, because because we don't want to look at all of the all of the contributions to standard of living that make some of those some of those discussions about income disparities really immaterial and useless well dr bradley i want to move us to what we call our speed round where i'll offer up uh, a couple of individuals and you you pick one and tell us why you uh, like that person a little bit more and it might offer up a a couple of philosophies and ask you to, to pick one and tell us why. So we'll we'll start with Malcolm or Martin. Ooh, that's rough, brother. I am I am certainly wow, that's tough. That's tough. That's really hard. That's really hard. So I'm I'm going to say I'm probably more in terms of my own work, uh, I, I lean more on Malcolm. I am I'm probably eighty that's from 70 Malcolm 30 Martin on 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 some of those things so I just taught a class on on black conservative politics and Malcolm X was a centerpiece of that of that course because Malcolm X to his credit and this is something Louis Farrakhan said why are we waiting on white people to do stuff that we can do for ourselves Right. And this is why I absolutely love Malcolm X. He had what I call this sort of two pronged approach. On the one hand, he was more than comfortable talking about all the issues externally that contributed to to or rather undermine black thriving. Right. So when it came to injustice, he was on that. But he was also he also had no patience for foolishness within black communities. And so he would call out any any sort of of uh, 
a practice, habit, or virtue that would self-sabotage progress. And he personally, in his life, lived that out. Malcolm X lived the the sort of consistent virtues that he preached about, which is ultimately, I think, why he got uh, assassinated. Because he was just, he was a, he called out truth. Sorry, he 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 um, called out hypocrisy wherever he saw it. And that's that's why I absolutely love uh, uh, Malcolm X, because he he did he did those things really really well, both of them. Well, that was a wonderful answer. Let's stay with um, let's stay with some of our leadership. Uh, the Honorable Mr. Garvey or Du Bois? Ooh, yeah, this is this is rough, killing me here. I'm I'm, I'm I was hoping you're gonna say like Godzilla or King Kong, <laughs> make, it, make it really easy. But you're, you're making this tough. Yeah, so I think you know I I have I I do have some some affinities uh, to. Uh, uh, du Bois, uh, because I think I think he was willing to acknowledge that 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 black excellence can actually do something right here, and that and that black excellence should be celebrated and should be leveraged mm-hmm. as right here, right now. Yeah, of course I don't go as far as he does in terms of his views of, of, of government, but I do really celebrate him for highlighting the the realities of the sort of black middle class, which I will say right now gets completely obscured in the definition of blackness. It's almost like the black middle class doesn't exist. And so for some strange, bizarre reason, people conflate the word sort of inner city or low income <laughs> inner city with the word black as if as if are are, are, are are somehow synonyms. I don't understand it. It's, it's 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 almost like going to some trailer park in West Virginia and saying, "Well, that's what that's what it means to be white." Right. One hundred percent. Right. And I have a vein that pops up in my head whenever <laughs> whenever I hear whenever I hear, "Oh, that uh, you know X and Y in the black community." And then, and then the next sentence, well, in inner city Detroit, I'm like, whoa, oh, exactly. <laughs> oh, whoa, wait, wait. Do you know most black people aren't poor? Most black people, hey, don't live in inner cities. They, there have been more black men in college than in prison since, since the civil rights movement. I mean, what, what are you talking about? And so I like the boys for that reason because he, he highlights he highlights the role and function of, of, of black excellence which i absolutely love we'll do one more and we're going to keep it with people versus uh, philosophies uh, jay-z or kanye this one this one this one too is is tough i think i'm probably going to i'm probably going to lean on 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 jay-z because of his entrepreneurial spirit which i absolutely love and 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 what i what i love about uh uh, uh, jay-z is that he and again this is this is why i love black enterprise magazine for example right he built a portfolio around around his success creative a man of great ideation he started in one lane and then and then just kept building right building enterprises off of that off of that uh initial brand and 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 just imagine right i just get excited thinking about all of the all of the the, the talent, the human capital, in terms of in terms of black young adults that need to see a model of someone who uses their their success to build a portfolio of making other people successful. Right? What he's done is he's created a, a, a network of bringing other people into it so that they can find success as well. And I absolutely love that, 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 that model, right? Each one teach one, right? He's not just in it for himself. He's actually opened up opportunities for developing uh, greater enterprises and opportunities for others. Thank you, Dr. Bradley, very helpful. Yeah. Very. Yeah, so we, we just have a couple more questions. Um, 
in doing some research on you, you got you to look at people's Twitter feed to see what they're all about, right? Okay. And I noticed your pinned tweet was, uh, was very illuminating. I know you know this, but I'm going to say this for, your, for the viewers. In your pinned tweet, you say, I've read thousands of pages on producing thriving kids. The basic formula for men is wife before children, children before work, friendships before solitude, and God before all of it. And you then say all of this is in the book of Proverbs. Sadly, boys aren't taught this, and instead America needs cops and therapists, end quote. All right, so you have to unpack that for all of us. Yeah, you know, I've, I've, I've been working with high school students and college students for over 20 years, and I've done it in, in inner city areas across the country. I've also done it in pretty wealthy communities as well. I've been teaching, I used to be a high school teacher. I'm a college professor now. I've done a lot of youth work in churches and in nonprofits, and over the last two decades, um, you know, I've I've sort of seen this formula that that does two things. One, it keeps young men from having contact with the police. But then, secondly, uh, it also keeps them from having to spend two hundred dollars an hour uh, telling someone about their past, right? And so, and so, I can't remember what day that was. I was really frustrated at the the ongoing narrative about the 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 disparities in criminal justice and policing in black communities versus everywhere else. And I said, look, here's the deal. <laughs> right? Uh, if you if you if you want to keep boys from ever having contact with police, it's a real simple formula. Fathers and moral formation. And because of breakdowns in in the family, right? Be, because of the 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 reductions in marriage, because of the dad deprivation that exists in low income communities, whether they are white or black, right? You have father deprivation across the board. A dad deprived boy is going to hurt somebody. That's what the data says. This 14-year-old young man who in, in Florida who murdered a 13-year-old girl from his school, his and, and right, his father has a rap sheet, right? These are white folk. This is a sort of standard narrative about, about the black kid from the hood, but this is a white kid who grew up in a in a fairly affluent suburb. His parents separated, but his dad's got problems, and it was his dad's deprivation, right? His dad had been arrested, child abuse, all, all those sorts of things. Uh, he just he 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 ended up being a statistic, mm -hmm. and so and so. Um, when you have strong fathers, uh, when you have strong families, when you have strong marriages, guess what it does? It protects children from, from, tr from abuse and trauma. And when children are, are protected from abuse and trauma, they're less likely to ever end up in the criminal justice system. When children are protected from abuse and trauma with strong fathers and strong families and they, and they, and they, are, are, and they have access to moral formation, guess what never happens? They don't end up running away from home. They don't end up uh, being abused. Sorry, they, 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 don't, they don't end up abusing alcohol and drugs. They end up graduating from, from uh, high school. They and, and they they also they also have far less mental health issues, and they're and they're much more likely to to go to go to college, and then lastly they're outside of the criminal justice system. So these are the sorts of things that that we need if we really want thriving young men, because you know ninety ninety seven ninety percent of our criminal justice system is full of men. And those are the sorts of things that I think that we should be investing in if we want to shut down prisons, and if we want to, if we want to reduce the number of of social workers, 
and psychologists and counselors that we have in this country, we can reduce the number of, 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 of those by investing in the institutions that lead to human flourishing and thriving, marriage, family, parenting, love, connection, right? Hugging your sons, loving them, speaking words of validation into them, telling them that they're, that they're cared for, that they're loved, that they make mistakes, we're going to love you no matter what. Those are the things that close prisons and, and reduce the need for, for uh, uh, therapists. Not giving people cash. Yeah. Right? Thank you. Wow. Well, thank you, thank you. Well, um, that is a good lead-in to what is normally our final question, which is, and and as you know, we talked about briefly when Nike and I had this idea thirty years ago, after the Rodney King trial. You know, all the dominant narrative was everything that you're saying. Kids are not hearing today, which is that you know you're basically doomed if you're a black kid. And here we were thinking, how are kids getting a more hopeful message? Who are the role models that they're looking towards? And so we created this uh, character, Daryl, a 16-year-old black kid who lives in forgotten USA, which is this imaginary urban city. Fast forward 30 years, and you're a 16-year-old black kid listening to a lot of the dominant narrative. You could think, this country has it out for me. You know, you could think, I got no shot. And unless I get that reparations check, I got no shot, right? What would you say to a Daryl who genuinely is concerned about his own life? Where if, Mich if Michelle Obama is concerned about her own daughters, right? Then what is the 16 year old Daryl? What's the message to him? Yeah, that's 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 fantastic. That's a that's a great that's a great question. And you know, I would I would encourage this young man to to uh, first of all read a lot of history. Read read history. Read history of of Black Americans in this country who 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 excelled under massive duress and 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 structural and institutional oppression. Got to read those narratives. Because those can really help form and shape an imagination for what you need to do in order to make real progress for yourself uh, 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 right now. And I think, uh, uh, secondly, I, I have this acronym that I, I, I use to sort of help people like Daryl think, think about his life, and it's, it's Dave. Uh, D-A-V-E. Uh, the, the, the D is, is human dignity. And, and I want this young man to know uh, that he matters. He is, he is a man of dignity and that he should see himself as having some value and significance because he's a person. And more directly in the Christian tradition, he's a person who's made in the image of God. And so he should stand up straight and tall because he is a black man. You have dignity. It was like the, the signs in the civil rights movement in, in Memphis. I am a man. Yep. Right. So, brother, you are a man, and don't let anybody tell you that that you are less than that. Uh, secondly, is agency. I want him to know that his life can do something. That you can make a difference in 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 leveraging your dignity for the good. And that people are going to tell you you don't have any agency, or they're going to tell you that you only have agency if some, some well-meaning white people give it to you. And I'm going to tell them, no, 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 your agency isn't derived from somebody else's help. Your agency just is. It's actually derived from your dignity. And so don't think that you need somebody else to help you accomplish your goals and your dreams. You don't actually need that at all. You can do these sorts of things because you have the, the capacity for, for progress and change. You have agency. The, the, the third one is, is, is virtue. And this is where I say, hey, bro, uh, there's some things that you need to know about, about wisdom. Uh, you can't be a liar. You can't be a liar and a cheater, a backstabber, or a gossip. You got to keep your pants on, 
if you want to make it in this world. So there's some virtues that you need to practice, right? Your mom would say please and thank you, things like that. There's just some virtues that you need to, to make it. And there are some people that are going to tell you you don't need those virtues, those values. They're going to call that respectability. That's some nonsense. Because the people who are the most successful in life are the ones who say please and thank you, uh, the ones who, who look people dead in the eye, uh, who, who, who practice gratitude, and, and, and who have a sense of, of morality in, in their lives. And lastly, I'm going to tell their brother um, that he should, he should practice the habit of empowerment. Uh, that, that is, that, that, that he, is, he is not only a man of dignity, not only a man of agency, not only a man who has a capacity for virtue, which this country and the world needs. We need some people doing good things for good reasons. But he also needs to know that he has a community of elders in his life who want to put power into him, to empower him, to, to, to sort of push through his failures and his doubts. And that he needs that. He needs to rely on the wisdom of people that have gone before him. So, bruh, pursue some, some mentors. Get some help. When you fail, make a phone call, right? Let people put power into you uh, so that you can be the man that you are destined and designed to be. So I believe that when young men understand their dignity and their agency and when they have an imagination for the power of their virtue and if they have people who are willing to invest in their own empowerment, nothing will be able to stop them. Wow. Yeah, I got to we have to change Daryl's name to Dave. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Bradley, that was that was some deep stuff. That was good. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks for having me today. Yeah, man. It's great. I'm so inspired to talk to you. Nike, you. I mean, I'm so inspired to just doing what we're doing, man. You are exactly the kind of person that we want the world to know more. And, you you know, it's not like you're unknown, but more people need to hear your gospel. Well, I... Yeah. I Dave needs to be from, from coast to coast, from north to south. I mean, that is... And Dave of every race. Dave of every that's race. That's right. Absolutely. And and I'm, I'm, I am convinced, I'm convinced that... And I, I, here in New York, I do a lot of work in Harlem... There's just a lot of hopelessness, right? This is something I got from Colonel West in, in, in Race Matters in 1995 or six when that book came out. Just the nihilism that 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 exists, and and what happens is that I don't want programs and policies that keep people comfortably poor, right? That keep them comfortably right stuck and not making progress. And, and I believe that the nihilism sets in when their imagination only sees them being comfortably stuck here. Yep. And when you're comfortably stuck and you can't imagine getting out, that's when you start embracing habits and practices that lead to self-sabotage. And so I want people to know that you can do it. You can do better. You can do more. You can get out of here and that people can't believe it here. And by the way, when you leave, bring somebody with you. And then when you get out, go back and 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 reinvest in those in those same communities. Well, you just gave us the that's the rationale for why we're even doing this series, The Invisible Men. Dr. Bradley, thank you. Thank you for our viewers for watching. If you'd like to see more episodes of The Invisible Men, you can go to www dot invisible dot men my name is ian Rowe. i'm nike and uh brother bradley thank you so much okay. you're very welcome thanks thanks again for having me i'm really honored to be to be on the show all right all right peace thank you for watching another episode of the invisible men you can find other episodes at the aei podcast channel on youtube or the website invisible.men, or wherever you listen to your favorite podcasts.